We are continuing our uh, series on the story, and today we are in the book of Judges, as was mentioned earlier, and um, as I was thinking about what we should learn about today is in my sermon, I had a bit of a struggle. The, the easier route would be to highlight some of the characteristics of some of the good judges or some things that they did wrong. We see Samson there, who uh, while did some amazing things for God, wasn't necessarily always a good person, or you have people like Deborah or Gideon who followed God faithfully in what they did, but in my study, I felt like God was pulling me in another direction, and so today, this is what I've come up with. I've come up with not what can we learn from the judges, but what can we learn from the entire book of Judges on a whole whenever you look at it. It's what can we learn from the mistakes of Israel in this time period. Now, a little background here. Israel followed God faithfully during the life of Joshua. Joshua was a faithful man, and as long as Joshua was alive, Israel followed faithfully in the footsteps of Joshua. They served God with devotion, but it just didn't last. Because after Joshua's death, they turned and they started following the pagan idols around them. And so God, he raises up judges around them. He raised up judges and all around him to bring him, them back to him. He raised up 11 men and one woman to show them what it was to really serve God. Now, whenever we think of a judge, we think of a public official appointed to decide cases in the court of law. Now, that's not how they use the term judge. Judge to them was a political, spiritual, and military leader that led Israel to God. So they did all. They did everything. They were a political leader, they were a spiritual leader, and a military leader that would lead into battle all for God's sake to show Israel what it was like to truly follow God. Today I want to begin by reading quite a sizable chunk of scripture. So just bear with me here. But I want to kind of share this piece of scripture that I think really sums up all of the book of Judges. <coughs> So I want to turn to Judges chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 9. Or verse 10, sorry, and go through 19. Judges chapter 2, starting with verse 10, <coughs> going through 19. And it says here that after that, uh, this is after the death of Joshua. After that, a whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord and the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around them, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat, to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of their raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was the judge, he was the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. Following other gods and serving and worshiping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and suffer ways. There are two things that we learn from the book of Judges. There are two things that we realize that we have two responsibilities as Christians. We have two responsibilities and each one of them is accompanied by a warning. The first of these responsibilities is that we are to raise your children to worship God. It is our responsibility to raise our children to worship God. 
Now there is a warning with this. Like I said, there's a warning with each responsibility. And the word, warning for this one is, if you don't, they will be against you. If you do not raise your children to, be, to worship God, then those children will grow up and they will be against God. That is just how it is. We see this in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, I want to reread this to you. It says, after the whole gen that whole generation had gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Something happened in between those generations. Something happened where the next generation that rose up no longer knew God. And if you notice that, and I don't think it's really on the new generation. I think it's actually the blame is more on the generation before. I think the blame is more on them for not raising their children up to know the Lord. And I think this way because of Deuteronomy 6. If we turn back all the way to Deuteronomy 6 where Moses is giving commands to the Israelites and he's telling them how it's going to be and making conditional statements with them on their relationship with God that if you do this, you will receive this. And if you do this, you will get this. He says this in Romans in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. We can see from this passage the importance that Moses is setting forth of telling your children about God. Showing them what it is to worship God. It's one of the most important things that we do as Christians. And not just as parents, but also those around other Christians. Is to raise up the next generation to have their own faith. Because we have to teach them how to have their own faith. Because if they are completely reliant only on your faith as a parent. Or as someone who loves them. Then whenever they leave your household. That faith isn't going to stick. Do you have to show them how to have faith of their own? The Israelites only followed God as long as the judge was alive. As long as that judge was alive, the Israelites followed God. But as soon as that judge died, they went back to worshiping other gods. Because they were completely reliant on the faith of that one judge. They were reliant on that judge's faith, not on their own faith, or not on the faith that they were passing on to the next generation, but only reliant on the faith of their leader. That's an example to us parents. Are your children only reliant on your faith? Or are you instilling faith in them? Now you may be thinking that's easier said than done, but how exactly do we raise our children to worship God? That's the question. How do we raise our children to worship God? Now let me be clear here. I'm not giving parenting advice on how to produce uh, children that are well behaved. If you've met my children, you realize they are not always well behaved. And if I knew that, I would do a better job of it. <clears throat> but what I can give you is some insight through Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and through wise people before me, on how do we raise children up to know and worship God. And ultimately, that is our number one priority. And I believe that is the key to the very first step of how do we raise children up to be in uh, worship God. And that's to be intentional. We have to be intentional with our children. We have to be intentional with the next generation. Because whether you like it or not, as parents especially, we are the number one influence in our child. So what we tell our children, what we teach our children through our actions and our words is what they will come to know. And as such, we should show them that our number one priority is to give them faith. Our number one priority is that they are faithful people. It's not to make good citizens, 
It's not to make moral adults. It's not to make respectful adults. And it's not even to make contributing members of society. Our number one priority is to have faithful children. Now our hope is that if we have faithful children that believe in God, those other things will kind of take care of themselves. But our number one priority is none of those other things. It is only are our children going to have faith. Now, if we do pass on this strong faith, like I said, a lot of these other things are going to take care of themselves. If they truly have faith, they will naturally probably be more moral. If they truly have faith, they will naturally be more respectful of other people because they will see the value of other people's lives. If they truly have faith, they will be contributing members of society because they will naturally want to help other people. But the key is starting with the faith. When we start with the other aspects, they may or may not have faith, and we may or may not succeed even in that one aspect. But if we succeed in faith, the rest will fall in place. And the problem is people often don't start there. People often start other places, and they kind of just hope that the church will take care of the faith part. Or they kind of just hope that the faith part will kind of take care of themselves, because don't they have to make that decision for themselves? Or at least that's what they tell themselves. But ultimately, until your child is about 12 years old, you are the greatest influence of their life. And studies have shown us that almost everyone, the percentages are extremely high, make their decisions on what they're going to believe before they're 12 years old. This is why it's so important that we instill that faith. Yes, it's good that the church teaches them about faith. And it's good that we have amazing Sunday school teachers and programs after school and youth group that take care of some of this burden and do teach them about some of the ins and outs of faith. But they do not take the place of a parent at home teaching them what it means to love and serve God. And it also is good that the parents do have that support structure. That the parents have the support structure of Sunday school teachers. The parents have the support structure of aunts and uncles and grandparents gathering around them to help them. Because as we know, sometimes it takes the community to raise a child. Sometimes it takes more than just one person. But it ultimately does start with the parent. It starts with the parent's ability to pass on that place, faith. In fact, if we look at a, a, a recent study of the National Study on Youth and Religion, it says that 82% of children raised by parents who talk about their faith regularly at home were active in churches as adults. 82%. Now notice it did not say 82% of children whose parents took them to church. It said 82% of children whose parents talked about their faith at home continued to go to church. Whenever those aren't true, even if they went to church, the numbers start dropping. In fact, another study will say that 80% of children whose parents did not regularly go to church and to be active in their faith did not have faith as adults. The numbers flip. Even if the parent went to church occasionally, it didn't matter. What mattered was that they talk about faith at home and that they raised them up to believe. I told you earlier that at, before the age of 12, most children have kind of developed of what they are going to think. And before the age of 12, how important it is that we instill them that faith. Because after the age of 12, if we haven't instilled anything, the biggest influences on our children's lives are no longer parents, but it's the peers and media and culture. You see, after the age of 12, the role of the parent dramatically decreases. Almost all studies show this. If you haven't taught and instilled what you want to instill by the age of 12, you're probably not going to have a chance to instill it in your child. That doesn't mean give up hope if you have a child that's over 12, but it means that you're fighting an uphill battle. Because now media, especially social media nowadays, is having a huge impact on their lives. And how they view themselves now is not through the lens of you, but through the lens of their peers and social media. And that will greatly change the way they think about themselves. And they need to see themselves as 
a child of God, someone who's made in the identity of God, who is created to worship and honor Him. But if they look at media and culture around us, that's not what they see. So we have to be a very intentional about training them and teaching them about who they should worship. We have to model that in our own lives and talk about it at home. Another thing that we have to do is we have to be relational. We have to be relational. If we look at the uh, Deuteronomy passage, and I think the intentional part is there. I didn't mention it, but the intentional part is there of teaching the child what it means to worship God, that he is the one and only God. But the relational part's there too, and we tend to miss this sometimes. It's a lot easier to tell your child what they have to believe, but it's a lot harder to actually be relational with them sometimes. But if we look at this part, there's an assumption in Deuteronomy that a relationship is there with you and your child. It says things like sit and talk with them. Share the road together with them and talk about God. You are to lie down and get up together and talk about God. Every step of the way, you are to be with your child, conversing with them. You are to live life with your child. That's relational. That's a relationship that we see there. And almost all studies will tell you that without relationship, no matter how true a statement is, it falls on deaf ears. Without relationship, the teaching that we give them will have no impact. Now, that may have not been true for every generation that's been out there, but for the generation today, it is especially true. They need that relationship to show that you care so they'll believe what you say. You see, knowledge without relationship just doesn't mean much, to be honest. Now, we know the truth, and we know that this, the statements that we are telling them and what we're trying to teach them is true, but they just don't care if they don't see that you care. And so they need that relationship. When the relationship is lost, children don't really listen to the stories of God. They may hear them, but they don't believe them because they need to see you living it out as well. They need to see you living it out, and that living it out is by showing them the love that they need and giving them the relationship that they need. That is how we raise up children to worship God. We're intentional, we're relational, we show them what it means to do it. And I believe that if the Israelites would have done this, that the children of the, or their children would have been worshiping God as well. But instead, somehow they missed this. Somehow they missed these things and they didn't accomplish them. And so the children went out and they didn't succeed. Now, that being said, notice that the studies say 82% of children whose parents talk about faith may not have faith. This isn't a 100% thing. You can be the best parent you can be to instill faith and they may still choose otherwise. And I said that 80% of children whose parents weren't active in their faith in the church, there was still that 20% that did. We should never give, out, give up on hope that a child whose parents don't even go to church or don't have active faith won't end up a Christian. They still can, but the odds are stacked against them. It's important to remember those things. So if you have a child that maybe didn't have faith, but you're like, man, I did these things doesn't mean that you necessarily did something wrong. It's still their choice and their faith that they have to decide for. And if you're someone who did not grow up in a Christian home but now have faith, or your kids have friends that did not grow up in a Christian home and you want them to have faith, there's still a chance for them. Don't give up. Never give up on them. But if we want to give our best chance that our children will worship God, that we have to be intentional with the message and be relational with how we do it. That is our best chance to do it. I told you there was two different things, two responsibilities that we had, and each one had a warning. The second responsibility is that don't worship the idols of the culture around you. Don't worship the idols of the culture around you. That's the second responsibility that we have. 
And this one is more on the individual. It's not on you necessarily passing it on to the next generation. It's on you right now. Don't worship the idols of the culture around you. The warning is this. If you do, God will be against you. So the first one, if you don't raise up your children to worship God, uh, the children will be against God. But if you worship the idols of the culture around you, then God will actively be against you. And it's very clear in Judges, when we turn back to Judges chapter 2, and I already read this verse, but in verse 13, this is what it says. Or actually 12 and 13. They forsook the Lord and the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreth. They aroused God's anger because of who they worship, the idols of the culture around them. If we turn back to Deuteronomy 6, just a few verses after when he's talking about instilling faith into the children, in verses 13 through 15, Moses has something else to say. He says, fear the Lord your God, serve him alone, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. It's amazing that all those years before, when Moses was telling them what would happen if they did this, are coming to fruition in Judges. It's amazing that if they just would have listened to the words of Moses, all of this could have been avoided. He told them how to raise their children, and he told them what would happen if they started to worshiping the gods and the culture around them. Yet in both times, Israel failed. Israel failed in both occasions. They were warned what would happen, yet they could not resist the temptation of the culture around them. And I think if we're honest, the culture around us is often very enticing. It's very enticing. In fact, if we look at the Israelites, uh, Baal, who is the male form of uh, a pagan god, and Asherah, which was a female form, were both gods of fertility and love. It was a sexual, sexually perverse worship. And if we look at our culture today, what is one of the most biggest idols that we face today? It's that sexual temptation around us. And it ultimately is so enticing as we are tempted by these things. In Greek mythology, there's a, there's a myth of Jason and the Argonauts. Many of you may have heard of the story. Uh, myself, when I grew up, I used to love Greek mythology and all the stories. Not because I thought there was any validity in them. I just thought they were fantastical stories. And uh, when I read uh, this as a child and when I was reminded of it in my study... There is a story of the sirens. And some of you may have uh, remember the sirens from either the Odyssey or Jason and the Agronauts or whatever story you may have heard. But the sirens were on an island and what they would do is they would sing these beautiful songs. And whenever they did so, they sound so enticing. They would hear these women's voices. They're like, we have to get there. That they would crash upon the rocks of the island and die. And that was the story. Well, in the story of uh, Jason and Agronauts, uh, the sailors who uh, uh, were traveling knew they couldn't resist. And so Jason brought along with him an amazing musician. And whenever they started hearing the song of the siren, it was the musician's job to play real music. To play music that would overpower the phony music of the sirens, the music only meant to destroy. He played music that was beautiful and showed them what music was really all about. And when they did this, all that phony music lost its power. <clears throat> the music of the sirens could no longer sway the sailors to go crashing amongst the rocks because they heard the true music, music that was supposed to be there. I think there's a lesson for us in this. I think we sometimes focus in on the phony things that we think will give us pleasure and think will give us the life we want. 
But what we really need to hear sometimes is the real stuff. In fact, if you even look in church history, especially recent church history, we see that the mainline denominations, whether it be Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Disciples of Christ, the American Baptist Church, the United Church of Christ, uh, or the uh, Evangelical Lutheran churches, they're all declining. They're all losing people in great numbers. Why is that? And then we see the non-mainline denominations and the non-denominational churches, whether it's Catholic or the Southern Baptist, Assemblies of God, Church of Christ, Christian Church, Church of God, Evangelical Free, or the Lutheran Missouri Synod, they're all broken. Why is that? Why are one declining and one's growing? Well, there's a really simple answer. It's that the mainline churches adopted a theory by an Episcopalian bishop uh, back in the mid-century that said that by John Shelby Sponge, and in his book, Why Christianity Must Change or Die, Sponge said that the church needed to abandon the conservative interpretation of Scripture and transform with the times and culture. And that was the only way that the church was going to continue to grow. And as these churches began to see this, and they, the ones, the mainline denominations I mentioned, adopted this theory and began to bring in elements of culture and become more and more like the culture around them and began to shed the uh, uh, inerrant view of scripture and different things. All of a sudden, what they thought would help grow the church decreased the church. What they thought would help grow the church actually hurt the church because what they were bringing in was phony music. What they were bringing in was the sound of the sirens. And it was making people crash on the rocks. I have said before to people that if you want your church to grow, it can't be like culture around you, because then why in the world would you get up on Sunday morning? I don't know about you. If I was going somewhere that was exactly like everything around me, I'm not getting up early on the weekend. But when there's something different about it, when there's something that it will impart on me that is different, that's what worth getting up for. That's worth being a part of. And that's what the non-mainline denominations and non-denominational churches have held on to, is that the church is God's truth. And it's worth hearing. We are to be separate from the culture around us. We aren't to be worshiping the idols of the culture around us. There are many idols out there, and many of them that the mainline denominations have adapted into their church service and have tolerated and said, we no longer think this is wrong. And in doing so, they shot themselves in the foot. And they didn't even realize it. And the only way that we will continue to grow and where God will continue to be with us is if we hold true that God and God alone is the only God worth worshiping. People need to hear the real music. They need to hear the truth of Scripture. And if we want future generations to continue to serve and worship God and not the false idols, then we have to raise them to know and believe who God really is and show them the truth of Scripture. That is the only way we can accomplish this. So my call to you this morning is remember our responsibilities. Remember our responsibility to the future generations and remember our responsibility to not fall into the temptation of the culture around us, but to be separate. And don't make the same mistakes as Israel did in the book of Judges. Let's pray.